thank you everyone for your patience. I really uh, appreciate you hanging in there with me that we had a conflict with our uh, webinar program. Uh, it seems that someone else from my office was also um, scheduled, had scheduled a webinar at the same time and somehow we were kicked out. Anyway, moving on. Um, let's move to the next slide and get, get right to it. So we are here talking about what to do if you've been sued and we're going to go through the anatomy of a lawsuit. I want to introduce to you my co-presenter Eric Pelletier. Um, Eric Pelletier uh, is sitting next to me. Good afternoon, Eric. Hi, Laura. Hi there. Um, so Eric I've worked with, he's been in Alpha Kerman for many years. He's a business litigator who handles complex business and employment litigation. Uh, he and I have worked on many cases together. Eric tends to get pretty interesting cases. There's one he might talk about that he's handling now, um, a sexual harassment claim that uh, he's, he's defending. It's quite interesting and he'll talk about um, some of the headaches that it, it causes and that you can all, um, uh, you might be able to, re to relate to. Uh, in addition to his experience, Eric is ethics counsel for Arthur Kerman and since 2004 he has served as a member of the Maryland Attorney Grievance Commission's peer review panel. So Eric is a highly ethical guy, a great litigator, um, and he's here to talk to us today uh, about his experience litigating. So we're going to talk about next the objectives for today's webinar. We, we want you to learn what to do if you're served with a lawsuit. I mean, that's why the title is, oh no, what do I do? Uh, what do I do first? Uh, we want you to understand why lawsuits take so long to resolve. Uh, they are not resolved in a week. They are not resolved in a month. They are typically not resolved in six months unless a matter can be settled. Uh, and again, if there's a settlement, all parties need to be in agreement of that settlement. Lawsuits and trials, litigation take a long time. We'll also talk about preparing for litigation and understanding the cost, the fees and other expenses, as well as the legal processes that are involved. Before we get started, I thought we would launch a poll. Um, have you, has your company ever been sued or has your uh, has any of your any maybe any prior employer that you've worked for ever been sued? So you have the opportunity to answer now. I see you are responding. It looks like a l more more than not. Um, we'll stop the poll now for those of you who responded. So we have about eighty percent of you who have your company has been sued, and twenty percent have not been sued. So the good thing is is that most of you have experience in this. Uh, whether as an observer or whether as a participant, as a witness, uh, working in HR, you're familiar with what happens. But, but we're going to get into a little more nitty-gritty so those of you who aren't quite as experienced or it's been a while since you've had a lawsuit, we'll talk about what is entailed. So the first issue is how are lawsuits served? Um, I think what, what we'll do today is take this entire premise of law, a lawsuit a, a, as an employment-based lawsuit. So let's just understand from the beginning that this is the stereotypical example of a former employee who's been to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, who's been to the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights, or who's been to any kind of local county agency, for example, the Baltimore City Human Rights Commission, uh, Howard County Office of Human Rights, and they filed an EEOC a discrimination charge, a harassment charge. Okay, Many of you are familiar with those. The process is it gets investigated, uh, and ultimately, whether there is a finding of, of cause or not a finding of cause, the agency issues a right to sue letter. And from there, the lawsuit must be filed within 90 days. The employee gets a right to sue letter and then has to file within 90 days. So Eric, if you can talk about uh, first how lawsuits are served and what exactly is a resident agent because these are corporations that are served. So how, how does an employee know who, who to serve? They don't serve HR. They don't always necessarily serve the president. So how, how does one learn how to, to sue a, a corporation? Well, typically what happens, like for in Maryland, for example, um, a, a company has what's called a resident agent, and you can look to find the resident agent for a company on a website that's run by the State Department of Assessments and Taxation. Um, 
And there you'll find uh, in some of the inf information screens for business entities um, who the entity's resident agent is. Um, what, what you can do is um, once you've got that information, you put it into your summons request or your um, complaint, and then when you file your lawsuit, it's on there for the process server or other person to serve to the named individual, the resident agent. Sometimes the resident agent is not even someone who's affiliated with the company, but it's a private entity that's hired by the company, such as um, I think there's a lawyer's, um, lawyer's legal service or mm -hmm. um, something like that. They have various entities that basically all they do is accept process for companies. So once that's done, <clears throat> the lawsuit starts, but that's not the only way necessarily to sue to serve someone who you want to sue if you're a plaintiff. Um, you can, in some circumstances, serve by certified mail or under the federal rules of civil procedure, um, there's a, a, a rule, Rule 4, that allows an entity to uh, get in, or for you to get in contact with an entity and have the entity agree just to accept it by some other means. So you can do it, you can serve it in, in various ways. And so, for get example, the lawsuit started. so for example, let's say that um, the company is well knows they're going to get served, okay? And they've been through the EEOC process. They know that the the charging party, the former employee, has a lawyer. That lawyer, who's representing the employee, can contact the employer, the employer's attorney, and say, "Hey, by the way, I, I have the lawsuit prepared. I have the summons." I'm going to serve the company. Will you accept service right. on behalf of the company? That's another way in addition to the four ways that are listed. And you'll find that oftentimes a company or the company's lawyer, if, if, if the parties know each other well enough, will say, fine, send it over. You can email it to me because that way uh, one of the questions about when was it served is answered because it's a little bit more um, uh, certain when you get an email with a date on it and you're accepting service as of that date and it ends a lot of uncertainty that way. So there are other types of employment lawsuits as as we all know, uh, as you all know who, who are participating here. Uh, it's not just a harassment or discrimination claim that has to go through the EEOC or a state agency first. There are several other types of employment based lawsuits and Eric can you talk a little bit about what those are and what the statute of limitations for bringing those are as well. Okay, um, there there are a variety of other types of um, of lawsuits that can be brought in the employment context, such as, for example, a wrongful termination claim. Um, for one way that could arise is you, as a plaintiff, have been fired, and you cl claim that you've been fired because you've done something to. Um, uh, report a, a crime or to do some other thing that's favored by public policy. In that context, um, you have certain rights if you fit within the, the elements or the framework for the public policy tort to prosecute your suit and, and um, uh, seek damages. There are, but that's not the only way. There are other ways you can sue and other grounds upon which you can sue a former employer. A breach of contract claim is, is one of um, one of the notable ones, although many employees are what's called employees at will and wouldn't have a contract claim. Um, but contract claims can arise in other contexts, such as um, claims where salespeople seek commissions, uh, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, other lawsuits uh, would be ones that an employer might be serving upon a former employee, like a buyer. Um, there are also cl claims that arise for wage and hour uh, under the Wage and Hour Act. So most of these claims, not all of them, are in, at least in Maryland subject to a three-year statute of limitations. The um, the claims for wage and hour violations, depending on whether the violation is willful or not, may have a one or a two-year um, statute of limitation. Um, and there are other claims too, such as defamation and other torts that might arise in the workplace that. Um, could give rise to a claim. I'm dealing with a, a matter right now, which is an assault and bat. It's an assault and battery um, lawsuit, as well as other things. We have a negligent retention, negligent hiring, negligent supervision, um, and also a wage claim. So those again are are other types of employment claims that are not your typical harassment or discrimination. And I claims. think the assault and battery would be subject to the one year limitations period. So deadlines, deadlines, deadlines. So we, I always tell clients, 
document, 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 very important. But in a lawsuit, you have to be very cognizant of deadlines. Obviously, once an employer has been sued, um, after notifying their insurance company, and again, let's assume there is no coverage in, 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 a law, in this particular lawsuit, what does the company have to first understand with regard to deadlines? Well, whether or not there's coverage, uh, if, if there is insurance coverage for the claim, or if there's not, you want to get the, the suit papers to a lawyer or get a lawyer involved as soon as possible. Um, in the insurance covered claim type context, it, it may even take longer to get the claim to an, uh, a coverage, I mean, excuse me, a defense attorney hired by the insurance carrier. So that it's even more important there to move quick. lined up with counsel. But the important reason for that is because the summons has certain dates um, specified on it when the lawsuit must be answered or some kind of responsive motion must be filed um, to address the claims of the lawsuit. And either way, what has to happen is the lawyer has to be in contact with the client and has to learn the story for the lawsuit. They have to figure out uh, who's involved, who the witnesses are, what the claims are, why there may be risk or why the claims are, are not valid. But that takes time. So don't cut it close. What you need to do is get the lawyers involved earlier and not later because even after the initial meetings, the lawyer is still on the learning curve. Uh, unless your, your lawyer has been monitoring the case and, and you're an employer and your lawyer has been monitoring the case from the get-go, um, he's, he's got to do his homework and find out um, what he or she can do to prepare a response to the, the lawsuit. That may include um, filing an answer, which is uh, a fairly simple compared to the next thing or the, one of some of the other things that the lawyer may do, which is file a counterclaim and sue the employee back or sue the other party back. Uh, and also, uh, uh, there may be an opportunity for the lawyer to file what's called a preliminary motion, which um, is often a motion to dismiss the lawsuit itself. But to do that, you know, wh when you see the finished product, uh, you might think it's easy to put together and because it, it, it usually will read well and it will be understandable, but to get uh, the research done and the writing done and all of the, the sort of legwork done to get the, the motion prepared and in final form, it takes time. It takes time. You have to have a strategy. It has to be well written and well researched and the, the attorney really needs to be up to speed on all of the facts and that can include reading emails, reading policies. Um, interviewing witnesses Absolutely. and again this is all before an answer is filed and typically Eric um, uh, how long does does uh, does the defendant have to answer the lawsuit well depending on whether it's an in-state defendant or out-of-state defendant it varies but an in-state defendant would have 30 days to respond to the lawsuit and that sounds like a lot of time but lawyers are people too and they have more than uh, you know one ball in the air at any time so um, in addition to dealing with your case, they're probably dealing with others that are already put at issue. So it, it just takes time to get everything together. So again, just to stress, it's, it's important to get a lawyer involved sooner rather than later. And what uh, I do want to stress that oftentimes, if, you know, if attorneys have been in practice for quite some time, they, they might know who the opposing counsel is, who the plaintiff's attorney is. So if there is a rapport already in place, um, if you know who the opposing counsel is, oftentimes the parties will give each other professional courtesy of extending deadlines. And those can be done, um, it's called a stipulation. Stipulations can be entered into and then approved by the court. Uh, but again, I don't know about you, Eric, I'm sure you've had cases where you're dealing with real jerks on the other side. You, you call them and ask for a courtesy to extend some time and they might say, no, we're not doing it, in which case then you say, fine, well, we're not going to do it for you. It gets very ugly. Well, sometimes that's just something that the opposing counsel has sort of, uh, it, they've taken on the personality or the anger of their client towards your client. And so what happens in that situation, you, you may have to go to court and file a motion for additional time to get the lawsuit, uh, the time to answer the lawsuit extended. Next, we'll talk about the rules of civil procedure. So what most non-attorneys don't understand is that there are rules that govern how cases must be brought, time limits, formatting of the documents and, and motions and papers, and other governing procedures. So the rules of civil procedure really are, um, it, it's literally, it's a book. It's a book that governs actions of the parties um, 
in, in a trial, in a lawsuit, in preparing for this. So Eric, can you talk a little bit about the rules of civil procedure? Well, yeah, th there are state rules of, of civil procedure governing the state court uh, actions in the civil context, and there are also federal rules that govern the federal, uh, federal courts and how things are done there. Federal courts also have what's called local rules, which are another layer of rules that um, may shorten or alter the general federal rules that are applicable across the country. And then let me jump in one moment and say that oftentimes federal judges have their own sets of rules where they post online uh, or they send out to the parties once uh, pleadings have been filed what their own rules are, which again are a, a third layer of rules that the parties need to abide by. Right. And, and so one example of why um, the rules are so important, if, for example, um, an employee sues an employer and sues them in state court, and they're relying on uh, an EEOC letter, a right to sue letter, to bring their claims, the employer may want to try and uh, move the venue, or what's called remove the case to federal court because the federal judges are very familiar with the employment cases, more so than state judges may be with respect to employment type claims. And so in, if an employer wants to remove the case, they have an even shorter deadline to get all the papers from the state court and file them with appropriate, um, an appropriate motion in the federal court. So that deadline is an absolute deadline and if you miss it, you miss your opportunity to get into federal court in front of uh, the judges that handle these employment claims very often. And who are also typically, um, uh, th their decisions are more favorable for employers. Right. It, we're, we're in uh, federal, circuit, uh, federal Circuit Court of Maryland as well as, um, excuse me, U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland and also the Fourth Circuit, which is... Very pro-employer. Very pro-employer. So, Eric, I, I know that um, we talk a lot about discovery. Um, discovery is not port discovery that's here in, uh, in Baltimore City. It's not a children's museum. Discovery has a, a, a legal definition, and it's a, a very complicated, uh, really, it's the meat of the lawsuit. It's where most of the learning gets done. Um, where the attorneys and the parties learn what the facts are. And again, it, it, it helps the attorney representing the company, the defense attorney, helps them understand, again, and, and prepare for, for strategy, which might be different. The strategy might change after more information is learned. Um, oftentimes, we, we love to trust our clients and believe everything they say. Uh, but once we start into the discovery process, we learn wow, we're dealing with maybe a different set of facts altogether, and we never knew the other side. And again, it's helpful for the plaintiff's counsel to, to get discovery from the employer so they can understand what, what, what the employer's position is. So, so let's talk about this phase of the lawsuit, the, the discovery phase and the, and the discovery process. It's, it's very complicated. A lot of things happen. Um, so Eric, how long does the discovery phase last, and can you tell us what's involved? Sure. Um, well, the discovery phase varies by the nature of the case and the court in which uh, the, the parties are in. Um, and so it can last anywhere from you know, two or three months to six months to nine months, depending on the nature of the claim. The more complicated the case is, um, the, uh, the more discovery time the court will allow. Courts generally have a, a sort of standard um, uh, scheduling order. Um, and what they do is they'll issue that oftentimes to the to the parties in advance, like um, the U.S. District Court of Maryland does, and has a discovery conference, usually on the phone, where the parties and the judge can decide whether or not there's sufficient time is allowed or if too much time is allowed um, for discovery. And they may also um, decide that prior to doing discovery, um, there might be an opportunity uh, to try to mediate the case. And in our district court in Maryland, in the U.S. District Court in Maryland, that's a very um, active process. But in any event, um, the process is so long in the more complicated cases, especially where it's an employee suing for, say, for example, discrimination, because uh, you have to interview witnesses, you have to find out, and, and you have to interview both sides' witnesses, so that takes time. So the deposition process is how that's done. But even to get to that point, uh, 
there is, as everyone knows, uh, a huge volume of information that employees deal with every day just through their email system. Mm -hmm. They're sending emails back and forth, and some of the important evidence may be in those emails. Um, if it's a sex sexual harassment case, for example, the, the smoking gun may be there for the plaintiff to find. But to do that process, to extract the data <laughs> and to sift through it and to produce what's appropriate, uh, as opposed to something that may be uh, completely irrelevant or maybe privileged mm -hmm. or something of that nature, it, it takes a lot of time. Often law firms get outside vendors that are uh, familiar with this process and have certain platforms to, specifically set up to deal with, uh, you know, dealing with the discovery of emails and things of that nature. Can I interrupt you for a moment? Sure. Can you talk, you mentioned privilege information. I think that's important for everyone to understand what that is and what that means. So particularly um, when you're looking at emails and you're deciding, um, let's, let's, let's just say it's a sexual harassment case and, and it's the typical male harassing female uh, and you're looking at emails that are exchanged, what emails might be privileged and how do they get to be privileged? Well, and, 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 and further, once once they're privileged, it means obviously we don't have to produce them to the plaintiff's attorney. Right. Well, generally, what 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 is privileged is um, an inquiry by a client to a to an attorney seeking legal advice, and that may include providing the lawyer in the client's email to the lawyer the factual background of the scenario. This is what's going on, sort of thing. Can you tell me what to do? And there's a derivative pr privilege that is that exists from the lawyer in his response or her response to the employer or the, the representative of the employer. Not everything that goes back and forth between a lawyer and uh, a, a client is necessarily privileged. Um, you know, where do you want to go for lunch today? We'll, we'll talk right. about the case. Is probably not privileged. Um, so that that's sort of privilege in a in a twenty second nutshell. Um, but yeah, that going through the discovery process is elaborate. So some of the things that happen during the discovery process are. It usually starts out with written requests for information. They're, they're questions called interrogatories that you send to the other side that you want the other side to answer. Um, there are also requests for production of documents and other tangible things, including, for example, electronic material that are sent out. And typically there's a 30-day response time for, for those types of written requests. But those are really the getting to know you phase of discovery because you find out what what goods, so to speak, the other side has. You find out you know, more about their case, more about what went on uh, between the parties, things that maybe your client didn't think were that critical, but in fact turn out to be important, or vice versa. And that's, that phase is important because it leads the lawyer to another round of sort of studying what's going on in the case. So if your lawyer sits down to try to plan out when to take another um, type of discovery called a deposition, she will want to do her homework, read through everything, and figure out what questions to ask the other side so that she can try and get the best information out or some concessions out from um, the plaintiff or the defendant, depending on which side of the case she's on, so that she can try and harness, that, harness and shepherd that information for uh, motions and, and trial. So the order of the depositions is also very important. Yeah, the order is, is important. Often what happens in an employment case is uh, the plaintiff sues and there's a fight to, to see who goes first, who gets to take the first deposition. Does the deposition of the plaintiff get taken first or does the, plaint does the deposition of the defendant or the deciding, uh, deciding representatives, the people who are involved in the employment action uh, at the ground level for the defendant, do they get taken first? And so, you know, Lawyers sort that out by hook or by crook, and but that, those are often the first depositions to be taken because they lead to additional information, adi additional witnesses, and uh, just other third parties that uh, come out who are mentioned during depositions of, of the plaintiff or the defendant that you learn have important information. So once that happens, there's yet another round of depositions often because you will have to go out and get sworn information, testimony from these third parties and, and outside parties. I like to, uh, my strategy has always been 
to be the first one to get the deposition as long as I can. So I'll um, shortly after, um, actually, or simultaneous with filing the answer to the lawsuit with court, I also like to serve on the opposing party uh, requests for production of documents and interrogatories and also note the deposition of the plaintiff. So we're the first ones out of the gate. And they can't then say, well, wait a second. Uh, we wanted to take the deposition first because I, I formally note it. And then, of course, we can always change the date if it's inconvenient for everyone. And, and of course, we always want to, and I'm sure Eric will agree with this, we always want to have answers to interrogatories first and, and the answers to the requests for documents first so we can analyze those because those are the documents and, and answers that the plaintiff is relying on um, to prove her case. So we want to see those first. Then we can prepare for a deposition to see uh, if we if we catch that person in a lie or if um, you know they're contradicting an earlier answer that they've stated or uh, an earlier answer they've stated in their interrogatories or if they uh, contradicted themselves uh, in something that they've stated in the complaint. Right, and, and Laura, there's there's one thing I didn't mention, and that is. Um, Oftentimes, in, especially in uh, discrimination claims or harassment claims, there are claims of mental anguish or, or lost, uh, lost wages, things of that nature. Emotional distress. Yeah, emotional distress. So that, that spawns another sort of uh, branch on the discovery tree. And that is, um, one, taking the deposition of the other party's witnesses and also naming uh, expert witnesses, that is, and also naming your own expert witnesses. So that's one part of the, one twig on the branch. But another twig on the branch is when there's a claim for emotional distress, um, oftentimes the defendant will want to investigate whether or not the claims are valid, and they'll um, ask for an independent medical exam of the plaintiff. And so in that way, the, the defendant's expert witness, usually a psychiatrist or a psychologist, um, is able to meet directly with the plaintiff, find out what her claims are, and test the, the, the bona fides, uh, if you will, of the plaintiff's claim. And, and that, that also um, dovetails with the written discovery process because by then the defendant will typically have asked for the medical records of the plaintiff exactly. so that they can give those records to the, ex the defendant's expert to analyze and do their homework to be ready to, to examine the plaintiff. Those are all really, really good points, and um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, with, with uh, those issues. Next, we'll talk about depositions. We touched on it a little bit, but um, it's a, it's a, everyone, as Eric explained, we know basically what a deposition is, um, but many of you hopefully have never been deposed and really are not familiar with the process. Uh, Eric, can you tell us how you prepare your clients for deposition and what employers should expect when they are getting deposed? Sure. Well, um, first with how I prepare uh, my clients. Generally what I do is I, I sit down a, a few days in advance, but not too far in advance of the their deposition date. Um, if I'm concerned about the client and, and think that the client is, is not going to do well or is not going to do their homework, I'll schedule two prep dates, one further out and one closer in, so That's I can check up on them to make idea. sure they do what they're supposed to do. And when you say homework, oftentimes you're asking them, review these documents in right. advance, be familiar with dates, right. be familiar with the names of other people that, that we're going to talk about. Absolutely. So what I do is I, I make them read the complaint, I make them read the written discovery, the interrogatories, um, and some of the documents that have been produced during document responses to document requests and I go through it, it with them and I just ask them you know what, you know basically what's the deal with this or what do you think of this answer why is it true why is it not and uh, we go through everything so we have the sort of study phase of of our prep session and I also um, at the beginning and at the end of our prep session I go through sort of the process of the deposition I say have you been deposed before. Um, this is what happens. We're going to go in an office. There's going to be a court reporter there. She's going to be taking sworn testimony under oath. Um, be careful what you say because she's taking everything down, or, or if it's a, it could be a male court reporter. Um, be careful what you say. Don't joke. Don't be sarcastic. None of that transfers well into a transcript. You, you, it usually backfires. 
just don't do it. Don't be sarcastic. Don't be sarcastic. Right, because what, what, what a transcript is, is that at the end of the deposition, the court reporter turns the entire uh, deposition into a written transcript. And then, as Eric mentioned, if you're reading that, and that is used as evidence in a motion for summary judgment or motion to dismiss, as we'll talk about in a moment, but that needs to read pretty dry. Right. Right? We need facts. It needs to be clear. No it needs jokes. to be dry. Jokes always no come out backward. It's just something you don't want to do. So I tell them, you know, there's going to be questions asked if you answer them truthfully. And just answer the question directly. I normally tell people, don't volunteer additional information. Answer the question. Answer it fully. Answer it truthfully. But don't go on to tangents because that will... Um, cause another five or ten questions on its own to pop into the lawyer's head and come out shot right back at the witness. Um, so that's, that's, what I, that's how I do it. And, but the, reviewing the materials is very important because what happens is the client reviews them and they'll come up with questions for the lawyer. And that is really a, a critical um, component of this because it means the client was un uncertain of what to do or unclear about a, a certain fact or um, needs help. So it's better to do that in advance than to do it or to find out that there's a, a gap or a question right in the middle of the deposition. And this is because, like we said before, everything's being recorded in the deposition. There are breaks and there are times when you go off record, but typically it's when the parties agree and then they get up and walk out of the room. That's when you're off the record. If you're sitting in front of a court reporter, chances are she, he or she is going to be recording what you say. So don't don't one don't discuss what you and your lawyer have talked about in the deposition um, don't say my lawyer advises me to say this or uh, on advice of counsel I X Y and Z whatever it's just not appropriate to do because what happens is your privilege that you have uh, in place with your lawyer may be waived and you certainly don't want to do that in a transcript because the other side can easily copy that out of the transcript put it in a motion and seek to have uh, investigation into further details of what you and your lawyer have discussed. So during a deposition, oh, I guess maybe we'll talk about that. Uh, let's, let, I, I do want to ask you one, one more question about deposition. So exp you, you've done a great job explaining the process should expect, but the question is, what happens in a deposition? Is it only opposing counsel who gets to ask questions of the deponent, or does the defense attorney get to then also ask questions? Well, in the deposition itself, and I guess I didn't really get to this, you're sitting in an office and there's a court reporter, there's your lawyer and the other party's lawyer, and maybe the other party. The other party's lawyers noted your deposition because they want to ask you questions, and that's what they do. And it can go on for a long time. There, there are court rules that limit... Um, the amount of time, you know, collectively a case can have, and individually with any one witness there, there may be spent. So um, they can go on for a while. They can go on up to eight hours, and sometimes a, a, a party can get leave of court to have additional time to ask more questions of a witness in a deposition. But it's a back-and-forth conversational process. The The attorney is going to be asking you questions and trying to lead you into areas of information that the lawyer wants to learn more about. Oftentimes, the lawyer may be getting out information that's adverse to the witness, and the witness doesn't even know it. So that's why, again, I say uh, just answer the question asked and don't go into additional information. So when you go through the deposition process, the, your lawyer, in turn, may object um, and may object to certain questions. But for the most part, you're going to have to answer the questions. Um, when questions come up that try to delve into privileged material, the, um, the, your lawyer should object and assert privilege, and that question won't be answered unless a judge subsequently tells the witness to answer the question after certain motions have been filed, etc. So that's essentially how the process goes. And wh whether or not I question a witness um, at deposition, I generally don't when it's my, cl my client, unless there's something that is left in the on the record that is so unclear or could be twisted mm -hmm. or, or used against us that could be easily cleared up and I'm certain that without any any discussion beforehand between my client and I I can just ask the question the client can fix it up and is not gonna fumble basically right, right. 
So Eric already gave the answer, but if you were listening, um, you might know the answer to this. Generally, how long can a deposition last? One hour, one day, indefinitely, or you're not sure? Everyone got it right. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, more answers are coming in. Um, more, all right, half, uh, more, about half of you got it right. We'll, we'll stop the, the uh, voting now. So half of you got it right. Um, half of you said one day. And the federal rules of civil procedure state that someone can be deposed for one day or no longer than seven hours, although there certainly are exceptions, and Eric can maybe talk about those. Well, I mentioned before that there are times when um, a case is so factually detailed and is so protracted that one party will go to the court and say, we understand the local rule says seven hours, um, but there's just too much too much information to go through here. Can we have extra time? And um, usually the opposing party's counsel will have something to say about that and try to fight against getting extra time or not. But the judge will decide how much extra time, if any, um, uh, an individual deposition can last. And also, uh, we, we talk about one day as being sort of a, a guideline for a deposition. There are plenty of times when you take a deposition, especially of a more tangential witness, and it only lasts an hour or so. It can right. be it can be anywhere on the spectrum. So for those of you who said, I don't know, I think you got the answer right. <laughs> right. Well, right. It could last as... Uh, right. Every, all of the answers except the indefinite answer was was really correct. Okay, now on to dispositive motions. And I'll tell you, when I was in my first year of law school, I, I kept hearing over and over, dispositive motion, dispositive motion, and I never understood what it meant. Um, and again, most non-lawyers, non-litigators are not familiar with a dispositive motion, what it means. And there really are basically two types of dispositive motions. You have a, what's called a motion to dismiss, and you also have a motion for summary judgment. Um, hopefully many of you listening today are familiar with at least the terminology, if not what they actually are. But Eric, can you explain uh, the difference between a motion to dismiss and a motion for su summary judgment? And let me just explain, um, a dispositive motion, how I have simplified it in my own head, means it disposes of the case, right? That's, so it disposes, right. It's, a, it's a disposing motion, like you file it and, <laughs> and, uh, it, and it's done. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the different types. Okay, so with a motion to dismiss, what happens is that that's usually filed, not always, but usually filed at the uh, incipient stages of the case. So there's been a lawsuit that's been filed, it's been served, and the lawyer for the defending party has to decide, am I going to file an answer to put the case at issue, or am I going to file uh, a motion to dismiss? Or you can file both. You can file. To, you can move to dismiss parts of a claim mm -hmm. and answer the rest. A motion to dismiss is something that um, tries to resolve the legal question of whether or not the claims in the lawsuit actually state claims for relief that a court can grant. It has to be claims that are under some recognized legal theory of the law of the state or the federal jurisdiction in which you are. The, the lawsuit is pending. You'd be surprised, but oftentimes uh, plaintiffs' lawyers don't address all of the elements to each claim um, that their client is attempting to assert, and it gives rise to these motions to dismiss. So, and, and, and in addition, let me add to that, many times you have plaintiffs who are pro se, yeah, and which means they're representing themselves. They don't have an attorney, so they're filing these lawsuits on their own. Um, they think they're a lawyer. They think they've included all of the elements in, in the complaint. They haven't. So that, uh, although I'm sure, Eric, in your experience, you can probably attest to the same thing I can, which is judges tend to bend over backwards for pro se plaintiffs and give them a lot of leeway, extra time to correct mistakes and, uh, and, and extra time. Yeah, I, I think that, that judges are generally lenient um, with pro se parties. But pro se parties... Uh, they are assuming the role of attorney for themselves, so they're, they, they, I think, should be held to the same standards as anyone else, any lawyer that's uh, trying to push a case through court. But the, the motion to dismiss basically looks at the, at, you know, the four corners of the of the complaint and says, is there something within that complaint that is a, a cognizable legal claim? 
if not the claim, or if there's more than one claim stated in the lawsuit, the claims will be dismissed. That, that's different than uh, a motion for summary judgment. A motion for summary judgment typically happens, although not always, at the end of the case. Because, and the difference is, you with a motion for summary judgment, you well, don't... Well, not at the end of the case, at the end of discovery. Uh, excuse me, at the end of discovery. Yeah. Um, uh, and hopefully, for employers, that's the end right, of the hopefully case. hopefully that's the end of the case. Um, but... Um, what happens there is it's a little different. You go outside of the four corners of the complaint. You look at the complaint and you gather all of the discovery materials and, and go through them and try to determine whether or not the opposing party has has enough evidence to to validate the claims that they've asserted in their complaint. So um, the parties will go through and gather their uh, interrogatories and go through the deposition transcripts um, and the way a judge generally looks at it is, even assuming that the facts are what what that we say they are, are those facts sufficient to allow the party to prevail on a claim at trial? Um, and if those facts aren't there, and you'd be surprised, but it, it happens more often than not, especially in federal court, in an employment case, um, summary judgment will be granted for the party who's who's moved for it, and and that that can be a very good thing because you can get rid of all or at least some uh, of, a, of a plaintiff's case if, the, um, if you're successful at summary judgment. So how long, what, okay, so once a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment is filed, in your experience, how long does it typically take for a judge to rule on that kind of motion? Well, that's the thing. They're, they're just, there's no um, barometer for that. It can be anywhere on the spectrum. Uh, I've, I've seen motions pending in cases for more than a year, mm -hmm. uh, summary judgment motions. Sometimes it, it just takes a, a month and a half or some shorter period of time um, to grant them. You know, and the federal courts often grant the summary judgment without any hearing. Um, they will just decide on the papers whether or not there is um, a claim or whether there's not. I think in the more the closer calls are when the judges decide they want to have hearings and they want to hear argument on the issues, especially when there's an interesting legal issue mm -hmm. that's wrapped up in the facts. So it can, it can be anywhere on the spectrum, but I guess the, the thing to remember is that judges have full dockets full of cases and, you know, to get to any one case, they have to sort of get through the others and it takes time. Right, especially to devote as much time to read and transcripts and affidavits and everything, and all the other research evidence, the law, the exhibits that are included. I mean, motions for summary judgment and motions to dismiss, but more so motions for summary judgment are, are very thick, voluminous. Yeah, they're quite elaborate. Do documents. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on, because we want to be respectful of your time, one last webinar poll, uh, and generally, how, do, how long do you think it takes for a case to go from service, in other words, the party is served, the employer is served, from service to trial. And feel free to, okay, we have a lot of people, about 36, 40, 50 percent of you have voted so far. More coming in now. Okay, we're going to stop the, the polling now and looks like everyone, the most, most of you answered you thought about one year. That can be. It and the, right. The answer is all of the above. Yeah, exactly. Right. It, it can take six months, eight, uh, one year, or, or more than a year. Again, as Eric mentioned, it depends upon the complexity of, of the case, uh, the willingness of the parties to cooperate on deadlines, not extend deadlines, etc. So let's talk about getting ready for trial. Uh, let's assume now that we didn't win for the motion to, on the motion to dismiss or motion for summary judgment, or we chose not to file it, and now it's time for trial. And, and most people think that all lawyers are trial lawyers. You're in trial, and you're giving uh, speeches and arguments to the jury, and that doesn't happen too much. Oh. A lot, most cases are disposed of or settled, uh, and we'll talk about settlement in a moment, uh, or disposed of um, on summary judgment. But if you do have to go to trial, what do we need to know? Well, okay, getting ready for trial on an individual basis with any one witness is a lot like getting ready for depositions. You've got to go back and, and look over the materials in the case, but by then you will also have the benefit of having transcripts of the other witnesses and the plaintiff and other people involved in the lawsuit. So 
going back and looking over that information is very helpful because you want to be able to be consistent in your testimony, so you want to have reread your deposition transcript and your answers to interrogatories, and, and you want to have be, be knowledgeable and have been studied up, so to speak, on uh, on the topic of whatever is at an issue in the lawsuit. So you're going to get with your lawyer, and he'll prepare you, and he's going to give you some idea of the types of questions and subject areas he's going to want to go into, and he will help you figure out how... Um, how best to, to sort of get the evidence out that's helpful to your side. So that's, that's generally the process. And, and what, what is also important to know that is that the lawyer is not just meeting with one person. Unless it's a, there's a single witness case, he's got to figure out how to fit all of the witnesses in and figure out how they're going to work best in terms of presenting your evidence in your case. So that's when your lawyer is rushing around getting ready for trial and he have, hasn't given you individually enough attention but is over spending time with other witnesses, that may be because it's more important to do so. Right. And also, uh, folks who are testifying at trial need to understand they're subject to cross-examination. Absolutely. They're also subject to questions by the judge. Right. And your lawyer should prepare you for some of the, 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 the subject areas of cross because you're going to have to figure out what to anticipate and how to answer the questions that the other side might ask. So... The other part of getting ready for trial is kind of your simple, what you would expect, um, general um, advice, such as be respectful to the court, be respectful for, for the jury, and, and understand the process. It's the attorney's responsibility to explain this process to his or her clients. Um, I love uh, letter B, no Bo, Luke, and Daisy do clothes. Um, dress conservatively and like a professional. When you are going to a court, you dress like your lawyer dresses. You dress in a suit. You dress in uh, high collared uh, for women. You know you don't you don't want to expose too many body parts. <laughs> um, you know, dress conservatively. No, I, there was I read an article recently about um, how one of the courts was very upset because a lot of women were coming in, a lot of women lawyers were coming in in sundresses, mm -hmm. you know, sleeveless dresses, things like that, really are not considered conservative by a court. Um, also, we have don't lose your cool and don't taint, taint witnesses. So can you talk about don't taint witnesses, what, what sure. that means? Well, generally, uh, there's in court where there's a, a, a case where there's multiple parties, the judge will typically institute what's called the rule on witnesses. That's usually requested by one side or the other. And the point of the rule on witnesses is to have each witness testify outside of the presence of other witnesses that will be put on um, put on for their testimony after the you know earlier witnesses. And so what the judge does is he'll sequester he or she will sequester you as a witness out somewhere outside of the courtroom so that you won't be able to hear what people are saying and your testimony can be independent and and um, unaltered by what's going on in in the courtroom. So what that allows is for everyone's individual perspective and individual testimony to come out. Now there have been cases where one witness will walk out of the uh, courtroom and start telling the subsequent witnesses what they said or what she said or what the he what the the other attorney has asked them and what is so trying to help prep the subsequent witnesses to get on to testify at trial that's a problem that's that's called tainting the witnesses and it can lead to trouble uh contempt sanctions from the court things that you really don't want to get wrapped up in and I had mentioned to Laura before the show that there was a case pending in Washington, D.C., where one of the witnesses was actually a, an agency's attorney who tainted subsequent witnesses and got into serious, um, serious trouble with the court and with the bar. So be careful. Be just, careful. Just you know, avoid the temptation. So we've shared a lot of information with you, and one of the ways we wanted to, to um, pique your interest and to stay on, um, I know we're a little bit over time, but uh, we'll do, this is our last slide, is to give some advice on how to reduce legal fees and maybe some alternatives to litigation. Um, the first thing we have here is, do you have insurance coverage? Now, insurance coverage won't cover, won't cover all types of claims. For example, it, it doesn't cover wage and hour claims unless there's a rider that's that where the um, plaintiff has brought a wage claim in addition to, say, a discrimination or a harassment claim. Uh, if, if, so, if so, then insurance companies will also cover the employer 
if they have that special rider. Um, a lot of insurance companies don't even offer it. So I mentioned here EPLI, which stands for Employment Practices Liability Insurance, also DNO, uh, Directors and Officers Insurance. So if you do have this coverage, and look into whether you have it, because I'll tell you, it's worth its, it's, worth its weight in gold. Uh, I can't tell you how many clients weren't even sure they had it. They called me, they, they had a lawsuit, they were served with a lawsuit, and they said, what should we do next? And I said, do you have EPLI? The response was, I don't know. I said, go, go check, go find out, because then all you're dealing with is really um, the retention payment. That's all you have to pay. Um, so that could be as, as low as $2,000. Uh, it could be as high as $100,000, maybe even more, depending upon how, how large you are. But um, short of insurance coverage, um, and again, that, that assumes you're going forward with the claim, or at least trying to settle the claim, there are other ways to, or there are other alternatives to litigation. Um, there's mediation, there's arbitration, and then there's settlement. So Eric, can you talk just for a, a few moments um, about what these three are? Right, okay. Well, with respect to mediation, um, generally the courts in our area, um, at least in Maryland, uh, have their own court-appointed process where they have retired judges or other um, lawyers who certified mediators. are certified as mediators and they are uh, named to serve as a mediator in your case. Sometimes it's free, sometimes there is uh, what I'll call a nominal hourly rate that's charged. Um, and then there is, on the other hand, private mediation where a party will go out and hire, again, a retired judge or a, an experienced lawyer um, to try and resolve the case. There are private mediation companies that do this, that's their specialty. Um, those are more expensive. You're char getting charged higher rates because because uh, it's the free market and the court's not directly controlling the process. In addition to the mediation um, process, where the parties will go and try and hash out their differences, there's arbitration, and typically for that to occur, there has to be some kind of written agreement that the parties have have signed either in advance of the lawsuit or during the lawsuit where they agree not to go through the court process and to have everything solved during arbitration where some retired judge or a lawyer will serve as the judge in arbitration or the arbiter to resolve all the differences of the parties and settle their claims. It, not settle, but decide their claims. Um, the difference in, between arbitration and the regular court process is there's extremely, extremely limited appeals from arbitration. And finally, there's settlement. Settlement is where the parties uh, decide that their lawyers or the parties themselves can can hash out their differences and come to some kind of compromise to end the litigation and move on with life. We thank you so much for your time today. Um, we're going to skip questions, but my email address is here. If you have any questions that were not answered, you're involved in a lawsuit, uh, you anticipate being involved in a lawsuit, or you have been involved in a lawsuit and you have a question about the process, uh, what to expect, or anything about discovery or timing, please feel free to call or email, and we look forward to having you participate in the next Legal Lunch with Laura. Thank you, and good afternoon.